So we are back in Women Matters and this is the edition of May 2019 and we continue the, the discussion or conversation we had last month. It was called in second generation cleaning our collective history and we were talking yeah very much in depth and we had the idea that it is not yet done. We should continue with that. Uh, so far we are in four and uh, I would invite you all to give a short uh, um, check-in and then we go into the topic. Yeah, I can start. I'm Heidi Hanlein and I'm organizing the Wisdom Factory and also these uh, conversations, uh, mainly because I learn a lot and I have uh, the people to talk to, which in my surrounding I don't have. I'm living in the countryside in Italy. And so I'm very, very, very grateful that we can talk in this way about the topics which are interesting to me and to us. And I too live in the, I too live in the uh, countryside of Oregon and um, don't have much opportunity uh, other than books. Uh, or friends who live other places to discuss these things. And the synchronicity, the huge uh, coming together for me of even the word second generation uh, this last month uh, has been uh, large and wonderful. And I've actually joined a group called Second Generation uh, American uh, Relatives, Descendants, Children of uh, Jewish people that uh, have all lost people in the Holocaust, have lost families. And uh, it's a gentle entry into that group of really high functioning, healthy um, people, uh, as well as beginning to go to uh, the synagogue for the first time in my life, to a, um, a remembrance of the Holocaust, which was very powerful. And so I'm starting at 77 um, to ask questions. And I'm so grateful uh, that we're all together. And I'm especially grateful, I, I could tear when I think of it, that there's a Viennese woman with us, Moni, and that Heidi is German, and that Victoria has had so much German in her life, and now, um, someone new that I'm meeting to today. Well, or last week, we, last month we met too. So this for me is a, a, a new star to land on and see where it takes me. Okay, I am the Viennese woman. <laughs> I'm also 77 and it's the first time I am talking this way to a second generation Jewish family and people. Uh, it has never been a topic in my life before. And it's a very sensitive subject to me, I noticed, because I've started reading books, which I haven't done before. One of them is uh, Tertia Lingua Imperii, the language of the Third Reich. And I noticed that there are many other books uh, about what we still use in German, phrases from the Third Reich, which maybe we are not even aware. And so I'm a linguist, I'm a translator. Language is very important to me. And I notice I can only read very small parts of that book because it really shakes me up. So Dorothy, thank you for bringing this in my life, which hasn't been there before. And yeah, I'm very much looking forward to our conversation today. Thank you, Heidi, for making this possible. Yeah, thank you as well. I'm Gerthaut, so I'm another German. <laughs> And living in the middle of Germany and um, my father being in the war and, and 
us having those conversations. So he was like back in an instant when he saw something in the landscape that reminded him. Um, so there was pre present. And um, when Luna came in, <laughs> I said, before I, I thought I'm, I'm the youngest, but uh, was almost 63. Um, yeah, and, and thank you, Dor Dorothy, for coming in and talking with us uh, in this and being in this conversation. I had a um, uh, wedding anniversary celebration this weekend, um, and there were different people from all kinds of walks of life and also several from the international community. And I had a sick uh, staying with us here. And uh, yesterday we talked a lot about uh, genocide, people, yeah, the experience of different um, countries and which ones you, you must not talk about, <laughs> like the Armenians or others, uh, what really happened in, in different countries. And in Germany, we are very much my talking about it or having that in history lessons. And my daughter started uh, reading with Anne Frank, the diary of Anne Frank. That was her first book where she really got into reading or when Hitler stole the pink rabbit. So, so that, that was a very big conversation in our family as well. Luna, you are the last to <laughs> introduce yourself. Hello, everyone. Hi, I'm Luna Ciavelli. Um, I'm a systemic constellations facilitator and a coach. And um, I've actually just spent the last four days um, with a social traumatologist, um, a woman named uh, Dr. Angwin St. Just who's been in the field of, um, of traumatology for over 50 years. So I've just been immersed in the effects of war um, on people of, of all ages. There was a real mix of people attending the workshop. There were around 50 people there. And um, we went very deep into how um, War is still alive inside us and we continue to enact the war uh, in relationships with one another and inside of ourselves. Mm -hmm. So I felt it was timely to return to this conversation with you all today. Absolutely. And I think we could dive into that because last time we sort of uh, talked about our experience and our childhood and how we lived that. And I think this time after Victoria has done the check-in, we, we could go into that. What is still alive today in us, of if we know it or not. And Monia, before she said already that she realized that many things are present in everyday life without us even realizing that they are. So Victoria, you can... Uh, 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 Chime in and check in, okay? Hello. I'm very happy to be back. I'm sorry I'm late. I didn't have the link for some reason. So I was just sitting here and trying to message. And yeah, here I am. So happy to continue the conversation. Okay. 
Okay, uh, I would say, Luna, um, as you talked about this experience, which is so fresh, would you like to, to share something of that and then we go from there? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, yeah, where to begin? <laughs> That's kind of the, that, and that is the interesting question, actually when we're looking uh, systemically is that um, whoever is the youngest in the family or um, we come from all that stand behind us. So we're the, we're the edge we're we're standing at the edge of all that's come before. Um, and uh, we're like a leaf on a branch of a tree with many leaves and then um, we're part of a forest and part of a landscape. So one of the, one of the things that's really sitting with me right now is um, how many different issues people brought to the chair um, that were connected with war and um, how we are living fractals of those traumas. And... Um, a fractal is like a pattern that repeats itself for anyone who, who isn't familiar. Um, and if we begin to look at dates in our lives when traumas happen, we can begin to track those patterns in our own lives. And there's a convergence of, of um, synchronicities or patterns that we can begin to see. So, Many people will have accidents on the same day, for example. Um, and if we start to look, we can trace those back. It's not always the war, but it's a, a violent disconnection that happened in the family system. Um, but these, these wars have left marks on our DNA. We can start to track that epigenetically now and also left marks uh, on territory, on places where a lot of blood was spilt. Um, there are higher incidences of accidents uh, or sometimes murders. So there are these patterns that repeat themselves in the same places. Uh, for example, in, in England, there'll be sometimes a black spot on a road and that's to warn, uh, to warn drivers that um, many accidents have happened there. And um, these spots can be referred to as flashpoints. We also have them in our own, uh, in our own DNA. Um, and so one of the things that I'm really sitting with right now is, is how to heal. How do we heal this? Because the patterns show up and, and repeat themselves because it's wanting to be healed in the system. And um, a big piece that Dr. Angwin shared was that um, in these fields of memory, what often happens is that there's a memorial built. So we have this place where people gather to honor who, is, who have died, but the problem with that is that it's just one side honoring who was lost. And um, so, so what she shared is that representatives from both sides of the conflict need to come together and they need to grieve together. And when we do this, together and and when we do this in these places then we can really affect healing because everyone is acknowledged Amen. so yeah that's something that i'm sitting with and in coming into this today i was thinking hmm do we have any representatives from both sides and is that something we could we could begin to do or talk about doing um you know, how can we do this work together in a good way and, and um, do what, what we can, which is working on that, those patterns in our own beings and also with, with each other. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, and there's so there's so much more, but I think I think I'll just leave it with that for now. <laughs> the synchronicity is so perfect, Luna, because you know I think we've all stirred in ourselves um, the old trauma sites, and I think that we're capable of cleansing um, or transforming um, that DNA um, because um, my father had a pattern um, that he presented as the parent to us and each one of my siblings have adopted it or reclaimed it in their, re in integrated it in their own way and um, I happen to have chosen my daughter-in-law, who's as different from uh, Jewish, uh, direct, all of that, and she's she's light, and she's uh, not, you know, just she's just the she's definitely the other. And he played that out. He picked always one or two people in our family to uh, to hate and to reject and to criticize. It was like really powerful. And I, as the oldest, picked that up. And for 12 years now, I mean, I've had an anniversary too, you know, an incredible liberation. For 12 years now, I've reenacted that trauma um, for my father, for myself, with my daughter-in-law. And it finally came to such a point of this will destroy our whole family. This will take us down, my son and his wife and the children, that we came together in a way that you're suggesting without any knowledge or kind of concrete sense of what we were doing other than, you know, it was as if our hearts sat together, the four of us, my son, his wife, Bill and I, and Bill and I were really the culprits, really the, 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 the demons in this. And it was as if I was listening to a victim impact statement when she talked about what it had been like for her. And it just broke open that pattern. And it was like, as if I reached the saturation point that this whole journey has been a, a, a path where I had to assimilate and recognize truths and compassion and wisdom. And suddenly the narrow focus I had about who she is and the incredible triggering that went on all the time with her just went away. And, and it's been three, four weeks now. And it, there's been a, a air of, transformation it's it's as if the black crows although i like crows but you know that ka ka that mean miserable stuff sort of flew away and in came some softer doves and and that's how my heart feels and that's how my body has been flowing and so yes it's possible and i i, I stand here to say that in my own world of family you know, not with the Viennese, not with Moni, not with, you know, the world yet, you know, I was able to release that powerful energetic um, prison that uh, my father passed on to us. And that, you know, being in Vienna and what happened to him created that. So in one tiny corner of the world, indeed what you've said has happened and I think the black spots on our family road are really not there anymore. It's, I mean, I'm, I feel like I'm being optimistic and maybe naive, but another part of me knows that I'm absolutely not, that it, that it, it did open and that's a powerful, that's super powerful and I'm just super grateful to have been set free at 77. I mean, it was a long time I carried it. So it's never too late and it's probably never too soon. Thank you for listening to all of that. It's just such a declaration of independence. I should have a little flag with butterflies on it to declare my freedom. 
you mentioned triggers and I'm wondering about how the collective DNA is also triggered in us. Uh, the, I have a very simple example that happened to me when Notre Dame burned. I guess you heard that in the States as well. Um, I was so fascinated watching it and, and I couldn't explain why. And then all of a sudden a memory erupted when I went to Dresden. Uh, and you probably know that Dresden was completely destroyed by a planned firestorm where the women and the children suffocated and everything just burned. And they had rebuilt the church, the Frauenkirche, and they put the cross that was on top of the spire in a side altar. And when I looked at this cross, it was just molten and twisted. And this all of a sudden turned up when I watched Notre Dame burning. Mm. And so in our, I have no relations in, to Dresden. I don't know anything. I just was there once. But something is in our DNA that remembers all the cruelties done to women and children wherever. And I sort of figured that before that, war had been between soldiers. They fought and their families were back home safely. And when Pearl Harbor was attacked, a military base was attacked. The soldiers died there. And, as, and then the consequences were that Hiroshima and Nagasaki were bombed with atom, atomic bombs to test them, how they worked. And this is something, a cruelty, I'm really wrangling right now. How, how is it possible to do that? How, how can it be possible that you inflict so much pain on people next door, as in Vienna, at that time. And we still have all these little uh, metal plates where to remember, so you can hardly step anywhere in Vienna not seeing a metal plate, some who, who lived there, who, who had, was put to a concentration camp. So we do a lot of memorial culture in Austria. But still the basic question, and war can happen any time now again. So how can we stop that pattern? And what is it that we as individuals can do to, yeah, is it shadow work? Or what can we do as women uh, to change that patterns? That's my question. That's what I'm really, ever since we started that and ever since Notre Dame burned, uh, I'm wrangling with. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, uh, Notre Dame was really, it went far beyond a church, some kind of a church was burned. I think it was a symbol of unbreakable, a symbol of lasting over the centuries. And then it held by the war, even though nobody really burnt it. And I was thinking about, I was in Bosnia three years ago or so. And you go there through the town, we went to the pyramids there, and you go there to, and there are holes everywhere in the, in the houses. So people live there just, I mean, like it just happened. So it's this generation that, that went through this. And I had, um, I was leading four nursing homes and in our kitchen 
we had brothers going to the one side and husbands and brothers going to the other side to fight each other and they had to work together in the kitchen so and it this really shook me up when the Yugoslavian war started it was like after world war ii the very first war in europe it was like oh my god it's coming so close and um i think the european union is a peace project there are other things <laughs> to it but for me mainly it's a peace project and to to and when I see all those um, right-wing people like wanting to go back to nationalism, that brought us where we were. <laughs> and, and so this is kind of how can we just give that up? How can we go with this so yeah it's like neglectance like not really knowing what was before so i'm i'm that is my main concern the other whatever that might be the the economic and all this other stuff but but being together in peace that didn't happen over centuries. It's the very first time in our in our continent that we have a peace period. And I think that is worth supporting it, no matter what the color of my my political opinion is. Yeah. That leads me to the article which Dorothy sent around last um, last time, and I think I have published it on the website at the link, uh, where it says that how many percent, but almost half of the people, or even more than half of the people in Germany, the younger generation, don't know anything about that. Not really. So I think it is uh, that we have the tendency not to want to remember. And we are nearer on these times, you know, and we, and, and, and Victoria, you have lived in East Germany. So you also have a prolonged <laughs> uh, a period of, 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 of seeing these things, you know, but the newer generations, they don't want to know it. And so if something doesn't uh, work well, then they find somebody to, you know, to blame. And it seems to me uh, um, that psychologically, we are not made for happiness. We need something to struggle with. And so uh, if we are too well off after a while, it gets boring and, and we need to, to do something. In our time, we have now uh, uh, activities uh, where people can do something else, you know. Uh, Men can go and do soccer and things like this to get out the aggress aggressivity. Or what I thought on Saturday there was a historic um, fest festa here in 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 Nani, and they have uh, several quarters of the city, and everyone has their their music band, but it's only drums and and uh, uh, and trumpets, and they pass by with all the beautiful costumes, you know. And every time when these drums come near you, you feel it, you feel it in, in your body really strongly. And I thought, and these people jump, 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 really it's uh, all the time. And I thought, if you have something like that, you can release the aggressivity in, in this way. But if you don't and sit all the time behind the computer games, now, now you can do it too or whatever you do, but without a physical way of releasing this tension. I'm not wondering why uh, these aggressivities are coming out now. People want to fight. And that's, I think it's a horrible truth. And the question for me is how can we 
deviate it or transform that in a in a in a more positive direction. I'm just um, I'm just thinking about um, my session with Angwa and I did a one-on-one -on -one session and we were looking at my own family system and on one side I have a history of um, massacre and, and murder and on the other suicide many many generations fractals of these themes and um and i make art and she said this is this is the thing because i said how do we what is the how do we enact the resources i asked her this how do we how do we enact um the positive inheritance and she said yeah you create because there was so much destruction so Heidi, as you're sharing about this, these people making music and moving their bodies and just getting that image again. And she said, you know, the fire is very beautiful when it's in the fireplace, but it, when the fire is in the middle of the living room, it will burn the whole house down. Um, yeah, so we, we come together, we create, we create in our own ways and we express um, and, and, and make visible in different ways um, that which we carry and we we transform it in that act of creation that's that's certainly one of the ways yeah yes it is a bit like martial arts isn't it you do take that aggression that is inherent in human nature and to transform it into art so there's no nobody safer in this world than an accomplished martial artist. So I, I've been I've been thinking about this topic a lot ever since we had our last meeting, and I also had a one-to-one -one talk with Dorothy in the meantime, and it really went deep, and I started to think a lot. And I think what you said, Luna, at the beginning, with bringing both parties together in one space rings so important to me, even though it might be tricky with the time and everything and figuring it all out. But I think that's sort of like an important part. And I remember when I talked to Dorothy and she said how healing she found that Heidi apologized and she told us about that. And I remember that my first reaction to that was that I also want to apologize. And it was a tricky thing because I thought I want to apologize, but I want to apologize in a sincere way. And how can you apologize in a sincere way for something that happened before you were born? But I still had the feeling I need to apologize. And I thought about it and I thought about it a lot. And I thought why and how and in what form? And I realized that there are two layers and the one layer is for me being Hungarian. And even though I don't very much identify anymore with any nation states, you know, I'm very much on um, what Gertrud said about the European Union. And I think we are at a time where we have to transcend that. And I don't particularly feel Hungarian because I lived in many countries and I identify with a lot of different cultures, but I still am Hungarian. And I have a Hungarian passport and I do feel a very deep shame about that. I carry a shame because, I mean, the Nazi regime here was horrendous. And not just that, but I think as a country and as a nation, as a culture, we haven't done our work of apology at all. I think we haven't even done the work of acknowledgement. We are still in that phase of denial and of, you know, saying like we've been victims we couldn't have done any different. We, we were the victims of World War I as well because they took territories of us and whatever. So it's a complete denial. And I think that is absolutely horrible because 
Nazism is rising in this country right now, in this very moment. And that brings me to the second level of apology. And the second level is that it is happening right now. And what am I doing right now? And I was thinking of this way of formulating the entire issue when, when people say like, you know, the horror of the Nazi regime was that one third of the population killed another third of the population while another third of the population was watching. And I was thinking, what am I doing? I am watching. I mean, that third right now who's watching it rising and not doing anything. And then I thought another little thought. I thought it wasn't actually one third. I prefer to say 33%. Because if I say 33% was doing the killing, another 33% were killed and another 33% were watching, then that leaves altogether 99%. So it leaves us 1%. And I think that's very important because 1% were doing something against it. You know, there was a Sophie Scholl and there was a White Rose and there was an Oscar Schindler and there were people who were doing something actively. And this is where I felt very much like, how, how do we belong? How do we get into that 1% and how can we increase that 1% um, who is doing something? And I genuinely don't have an answer at this point, but I think it's kind of like our work. I think the real work is done when we get into that 1% and we start increasing that 1%. That's what I think at the moment. You are muted, Dorothy. I unmute you, just a moment. Uh, okay, now you can speak. Hold that thought in your big heart, Victoria. Hold that thought. There's so many ways that you know, each one of us have really asked questions about which way and um, how to do it. and. I always think of it more on a personal level um, because I feel like my, my system, who I am, my family, all of you, um, when I sing, when I run, when I do, Luna, what you were saying, you know, manifest the art. I, I just think that there's so many ways to do it. And, and I think each one of us has a strength or a proclivity to do it one way or another and we're doing it you know i think we're in the one percent um but i just lost what i was going to say anyway that that's what i that's what i think is happening and i'll write down what i was going to say because i just lost it and it was really important <laughs> yeah that's actually really interesting because i have the memory now of when our fides again won the elections earlier this year and I was totally devastated. I was, I remember I was coming back from Budapest into my cottage. I was driving in the car and I thought, oh my gosh, I, I have to go into politics. That was my first reaction. I, I have to, I have to, which I absolutely hate, but I have to do something. I mean, what, what, you can't just sit while, while this is happening. And I went back into my cottage and I was sitting in the garden and somehow I was meditating with with a woman who lived um, from, I think she was a young woman around the, the time of World War II, and then she lived very, very old. She, she died um, recently. Uh, Sepesh Maria, who's a wonderful, wonderful writer and spiritual teacher because while World War II was going on, she was sitting in a bomb shelter and she started to write the book, The, the Red Lion, which is basically an alchemist book. It's a description of the soul's evolution during uh, many, many lifetimes. And I don't know how she got these ideas in, in those times when this wasn't as publicly discussed as it is today. And the Nazis burned her books and the communists burned her books and it was forbidden and it was destroyed. 
And um, her books only survived because one librarian just saved a copy and those copies were hand copied during the whole communist time by people and they were distributing it underground, so to speak. And then later on, she became really famous. And see, she somehow came into my consciousness. It, I really felt that she was there and she sat down with me in my garden and she said, what we did at that time, we were creating safe places and we were doing underground work to make sure that a higher level of spirituality is spreading. And I found that remarkable. I found that very interesting. And I think, yes, you're right, we are doing that. And probably have to get that on a more powerful level. And the more powerful it is, the, the better. I do believe that it is genuine inner work and spirituality that is fighting the Nazis. Nothing else ever will. Thank you, Dorothy, for saying that. I think it's that we are in the 1%, but it must not let us be complacent and say, okay, <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> we are the good, good guys. Um, yeah, I th think actionism isn't the answer but there is this kind of action that doesn't need to be outside action. So um, how can I, in, in this, I was talking about our celebration on Saturday. We were 70 people and it was such a, I, I mean, there were 70 different <laughs> from all walks of life. So it was really interesting. So they never met and they had completely different ideas and politics and whatever. And it was such a calm and, and deep connection among the people. And one of which there was one man who didn't participate much, but he was, I think he was meditating most of the time. And then people came to him and asked him how he's doing. He said, I'm excellent. <laughs> and, and I have the feeling that his energy is also spreading and doing some of the work. So I mean, there were nice people meeting each other and and being nice to each other and helping and all this, he didn't mu do much of that. He was just there. <laughs> and, and you saw him often with closed eyes and um, he, uh, he was having a wonderful time without doing anything and having this calm and joyful energy spreading out. So, so, for me, the, the, the word ahimsa is a very big one. This like, um, nothing in me wants to harm anybody, you specifically or somebody else. And, and to live that makes a difference in the way we react because I take responsibility for aggression outside of me. <laughs> so what in me causes that, that people have to be aggressive towards me or whatever. So if I take um, this concept for me, it's like really peacefulness, not a very active form of being peaceful and, and spreading peace. So I think we can do a lot more energetically than we think we can. And yeah, not being yeah. the victim of what happens or only the bystander. Uh, yesterday we had the Integrale Salon in Vienna and we talked also 
about Aurobindo. I don't know whether you know his history, but he uh, joined a terrorist organization one time against the British occupation and was brought to prison and was brought to trial. Uh, but he learned to meditate while he was in prison. And at the trial, he was just sitting there and viewing everybody else, not as an enemy, but just as another human being and possibly one time an enlightened human being. So he sat there, as you mentioned that man, and just uh, created this energy. And he was the only one not sentenced to prison. But afterwards, he had to fl flee to Pondicherry to the French occupation zone because the British still didn't like him. So when in a very difficult situation and you can create peace in yourself, maybe this really influences. This is what just came up. Uh, on the other hand, I will have uh, the 60th anniversary uh, of our graduation in two days. And I sent to the girls of my class a questionnaire. Uh, is there still something that reminds you of the war? Unconsciously, maybe even, are there habits that still go back there? And some found it very interesting, like I always have to have a supply of food at home because or chocolate, I, I just can't go without chocolate because there was no chocolate during the war. But mm. some of them, or at least I don't know of one, uh, refused to reflect on their own life. They just wanted to be busy. They have to be so busy. They have to garden and the, the, the animals and their children, grown up children. They didn't want to reflect. So everybody according to his own level of consciousness is my said <laughs> or at least amused let's put it like this because you can't as we say in german du kannst nicht aus deiner haut you can't leave your skin it's just the way you were born and it's in your dna yeah and i'm glad that some really found it interesting and replied very thoroughly and quite amazingly what they all said, yeah. But this is what I can contribute. That's Wonderful, could you write a sort of a list of, of the main answers and we, we can A uh, list of the main it? questions, yeah, I can, yeah, yeah, I have yeah. to translate it because it's in German, of course. Yeah, but okay. Yes, I gladly do that. Mm -hmm. It would be wonderful to, to hear that. Yeah. I was not born in the war, but I, I have this thing. I have always to have enough food in the house, which when 20 people come, I could feed them, you know, I, out of nothing. <laughs> and I know it's a bit weird, but... And I cannot throw away food. When I had still chicken or uh, other animals who ate the stuff, it was fine. And so <laughs> it fits nicely into that. I had a huge cherry tree full of cherries already done and they, because of the rain, they are about to, to, to go bad. No? And so I called the, the nuns Here, nearby. There are nuns uh, taking care for older people and they have a whole lot of young nuns or as aspirants of becoming nuns and normally they come in two and three and pick the food which I don't need. Today they were in ten from four or five different countries and that was so wonderful to, to, to see them so alive and so um, joyful and you would always think nuns are like this but they have all this other energy too and that was just, I don't know why I said that just now, but it, it was uh, nice to, to witness. Ah, it was because of the cherries. I didn't want to, to, to just let them go bad. And so I found a way so that at least 20 people are happy to have fresh cherries. It's a good story. I could, I could share about two different 1% um, activities 
um, Diana Lindemann, the woman who uh, is trying to join us, her mother, Ruth, um, is probably in her early 80s, and she was five when she left uh, Vienna, when, well, when, when it all broke out in Vienna. And her, her mission, she, it has been for the last many years, is to go to schools and to tell her story. She has organized um, an incredible way of sharing what her experience was like, and she's written several books. I mean, she was a woman who raised three children and was the wife of some businessman in Portland. But I mean, she's just transformed herself into the messenger. And um, I, I just find that so admirable. And Oregon, Portland, the city I'm closest to, Oregon, actually, the state I live in, just passed uh, a mandate that for, for the first time, the Holocaust and the Second World War would be included in the history books. I mean, can you believe that, that they left that out? So now that's going to be a curriculum and several other states in the country have done it. And maybe people like one of us suggested will pick that up. And the other thing, Luna, the other good news is that my husband, Bill, for the last three years has been a an activist, a political person, which he's not. He's like you, Victoria. I mean, it was just odious to him to do that. But uh, climate change is just so uh, important to him to mobilize an awareness and awareness and make some steps. And it was very hard. And about a week ago, he fell kind of into a dark place, a quiet place. And so he journaled as he usually does. And he realized the voice spoke to him and he's returning to his art. And he's an incredible artist and he's always done not only beautiful things that people buy and put in their homes, but big kind of mythical statements and a lot of Mexican mythology statements, things without even worrying whether he could sell them or not. They just want it to be expressed. And so now his intention is to take his incredible sense of urgency and love and um, care for our world and manifest that in his artwork. And so many people have just cheered him on and said that's so important and that so few, many people are activists, but few really are able to express it visually and in a very excellent way. So that's really, those are two one percenters that I can report on that are really, um, I think, going to make a big difference, a big difference. Yet it so very much resonates and I'm so happy for Bill because I was just thinking of um, something that Michael Ende said, who's a wonderful surrealist writer um, from Germany and uh, he once was also speaking about um, environmental issues. I think he became aware of that much earlier than a lot of people when he started writing about it. And he said, if you want to save, say the trees, if you stand up and start to shout slogans and do that sort of classic activism, then I don't exactly remember what he said about that, but he said it, it might or might not make a difference. He said, what will really make a difference when people stop really cutting out trees when they have an emotional connection to a tree? People who learn to love trees, they will just not cut out a tree in the same way as you would not cut out a person or an animal that you love. And the reason why this came to me now, because I think as a society, we tend to regard art as something cute, something pretty, you know, some decoration that is nice when we've done all the important work that we can do a bit of art. But actually it's the other way around because art can talk to their heart. It can really make people love something. And then when they love something, they care about that. So I think that way, I think with the inner voice that Bill had, it's probably, coming from a source of wisdom that says that he can actually make a greater impact with art than with the political activism, which is more like a, 
outward thing. But the art touches people so deep that then they really will change. And people who change, they just don't cut out trees and they don't pollute the environment. They just don't. Because they love, if I love the forest, I'm not going to litter it and I'm not going to cut out trees. It's absolutely impossible. I, it's just coming from the heart. So that's already done. The work is done when it touched your heart. Well put. Gertrude, you have to go in a short while, so do you want to do your final statement on that? Yeah, there are many thoughts coming up when you were talking <laughs> about art and uh, um, like the photos my husband does or um, the project uh, in, in uh, Bulgaria where they take kids from the street and um, teach them classical music. Um, yeah. And, and uh, I didn't share on this celebration. We said we have everything. So we would like you to, to donate to a, an organization that uh, works on inclusion of refugees. So like, mm. Thank you. Um, having communities, uh, having one room for a single um, person from Syria or wherever. And that is really, really very effective to live together, <laughs> cook together, clean the house together. And, and they are doing such a good job and my, my daughter's on that, on that um, board. And we said, well, this is the, the closest connection to an organization we have. So we would look, like you instead of uh, presents, uh, do that. And yesterday evening, we, we counted the money and it was over 600 euros to, for this organization. And they were like, oh my God, <laughs> they, they, this was the very first time they had something like that. And, and they, the people, they came and said, where can I leave the money? I think it's such a good idea. So I think people want to contribute only when they are in fear. You said, uh, I think happiness needs remembrance fear is triggered <laughs> so so to survive we don't need happiness but to to live together in a good way we we have to um, contribute to come together to be in connection together uh, being touched by art by other people and when that happens this is not stored, so we have to do that again. So we have to be conscious about this. We don't have to be conscious about fighting. That is inbuilt. But we have to be conscious about how do we want to be together. And uh, yeah, so if you take it for granted, you lose it. And thank you very much for that conversation. I'm really grateful for our encounters and especially for those two hours we had, the last one and this one. Thank you very much. And I have to leave. Sorry. Yeah, we are at the end of the hour, so we can start having a check out. It can be a, a little longer if you want to. We can go a little bit over the hour, so it's not a problem. I have a call coming in in a few minutes, so maybe I, if I can check out and say goodbye. Um, thank you so much for having this conversation. Um, yeah, I think uh, what 
one of the things we can really do to be that 1% is to tell the truth. And thank you, Dorothy, for sharing about um, the curriculum changes in Oregon. That's so wonderful to hear. Yeah, it really is. Um, yeah, truth is a casualty of war. Things are lied about and covered up. And if we continue to do that, then we continue to enact that. So yeah, coming together and telling the truth. So thank you for this, this space to do this, Heidi, and, and all of you. Um, yeah, and, and also Dorothy, I'm just thinking about you sharing about your family coming together as you did and making something that was unconscious, conscious. And um, again, that's us telling the truth with each other and with our families and, and recognizing our parts and, and we do shift things and change things. Yeah, and, and I, I love, and I think I've shared it here before, but I'll share it again because I love it so much, which is a Mother Teresa quote. Um, she says, um, if you really want to create peace in the world, go home and love your family. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you all for today and I look forward to our next conversation. And um, yeah, thank you. Namaste. Yeah. Thank you, Luna. Hi, Luna. Loving your family. Yeah. Was all our heart. And as uh, I think Victoria mentioned that once your heart is touched, the work is done. So that's also a beautiful statement. And yeah, I'm looking forward to our next conversation. I'm still hesitant about including men, uh, as you mentioned, Heidi. Yeah, but it, the topic still will simmer on and yeah, maybe we just keep it boiling and see what, what is cooked afterwards. Mm -hmm. Thank you all. Thank you, Moni. <clears throat>well thank you also i'm very touched and very honored to be here and there's a lot i will take with me from tonight and i think the thinking is continuing and the feeling is continuing and the work is continuing and there's um, just as a as a goodbye statement or, or thought is to say i thought of something else that michael and said <laughs> Uh, because he also said that he doesn't like the word tolerance. Yeah, when he's speaking in German, it is like fremden tolerance, yeah, tolerating the, the foreigners. He says, tolerating means that I, I don't like it, but sort of clench my teeth together. And yeah, he says, I tolerate a fly in the kitchen, or you know, I tolerate my toothache. But if I say I tolerate the foreigners, then that's not really a compliment towards the, the foreigners. And he said, I. I'm inviting diversity because it's good for me, he says. It's more interesting. The food is more interesting. You have different recipes. The culture is more interesting when we have different languages and different stories and different backgrounds. And I think that links so much to actually this kind of positive twist on things. You know, how can we make sure that horrors like, like the Holocaust never happens? And it's just like getting to know each other and making friends all over the world because then we don't have to be afraid of each other. We just like realize it's actually good that we are so different. So I think for my life, the greatest lessons and the greatest goods that, that came out of it was when, when I was traveling and, and living with different people because I realized everybody's welcome. It's the more we are, the better, and the more diverse we are, the better. 
and I think doing work in that is just introducing people to people and just show them that diversity is a good thing. I think that can make a huge difference. No, no one is the enemy. It just doesn't exist except within all the forces that we haven't tamed yet, but it's not outside. It's never outside. Thank you. I th for me, um, Heidi, you're so good at moving it. Um, the question that I has that has come up for me a lot because even for me, this is a new subject because it was closeted, and as Luna said, it, a lot of my behavior was unconsciously driven, um, partly by the prismatic copying of my father. He especially. And um, now that it's opening and I'm with other Jewish people and I see how different people are acting, the question that I have, and this may seem really naive, but I don't know where else to ask it, but to ask all of you is why you think, and I know the Jews aren't the only ones that have been singled out over and over again, but I'd be curious why we're, um, so universally uh, disliked and why there's always a disport if why we always have to leave where we are and I I'm just so curious because being you know who I am anyway you know I know that you know some of my mannerisms are a little bit um, kind of beyond the American uh, standard of being nice and being polite and not saying no and not really asking for what you want. I'm pretty out there, and you know I hope not in a in a in a destructive or, or uh, you know way that is you know hurts people. And I don't know if that's part of why. So that would be my question. If we're going to stay with this, um, I'm going to like uh, Moni sent out her little questionnaire. You know I'll give a verbal questionnaire. What, what do you think that is? And um, you know what, that, that's, that's what it is for me, why? And um, other than that, this, this is like a peeling of an onion in a beautiful kitchen. I mean, I am so um, safe with all of you. And you know, I'm so glad Moni is there from Vienna. I'm so sorry to keep harping on this. But it just, I don't know, there's a real connection for me because I've been to Vienna many times and, you know, and I just didn't feel good there. I didn't feel at home there, as beautiful as it is. And so I'm so glad that someone who lives there and knows it and must embody some of the best of Vienna, Austria, is, is, is with, with me, is in a group with me. And... Um, <laughs> You may be amazed to hear that right now, slowly but steadily, I don't feel at home in Vienna at all because we have so many tourists and so many people from southern states who beg or who bring with them a culture we are not used to. So we are at our old age, we have to say it's a different city right now. Uh, yeah, but your question is a good one. And maybe we could continue on this the next time. So that's really, yeah, that's a sharp question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we could be make it a bit, a little bit more generalized. Uh, why do we need, uh, need scapegoats? Why, you know, uh, because, and then we can do it specifically. I would like to include the other women who are, not we're not so much interested in the Holocaust thing, which and which we have talked about. So we can make it more generalized. And a, a, a quick thing of what came intuitively to me, I think it has much to do with envy. Uh, in my opinion, that uh, certain groups of people, it's not only Jews, it depends on which countries they are, they, they get marginalized and fought and uh, diminished and all sorts of things. But I would be happy to, to talk about that. And maybe we next month we can try to, if you find some um, writing or some, some resources on that, I would be 
happy. I don't have much time in the next uh, before we meet again. So, but I set it up, and it would be fine. And Thank for you. my yeah, for my checkout, I'm really, really, really glad that we are moving that, and I think we are sort of entering into the one percent by by talking about these things. And there are still enough people who don't want to talk about it. That's their thing. But at least we do our we do our part. And I was very much uh, uneasy about this uh, my German past, you know. And I feel that it's slowly um, dissolving yeah. because I have the idea or the, the feeling that I finally do something instead of thinking about it, <laughs> you know. Yeah. <laughs> so that's. Uh, and I, I couldn't do it alone, so thank you to, to everybody. And mm -hmm. let me see next month.